<laughs> Pilots are always lost. And uh, that, there's a long history of that. And how you get from one point to another is always an interesting challenge. Even those of us who have played video games where we've flown airplanes, we are, get lost as well. So navigation has been a persistent problem from the beginning. Early on, it was very rudimentary. You would try to set a compass heading and get to where you were going, but if you got lost, which was often the case, you would look for a highway, look for a railroad, and follow it to the nearest town. And one of the things that happened in the United States was that they tended to paint on the roof of all of the railroad stations in these towns the name of the town. So when the pilot flew overhead, saw the name, they knew where they were. That's changed over time. We've become much less dependent on maps and those sort of rudimentary navigational systems. We now have a whole variety of others and GPS is the central one today. It will take us from point A to point B anywhere in the world. Well, there's lots of stories in aviation history and space history that are, that are great fun. And uh, some of them relate to uh, a whole variety of things. I mean, I've always been fascinated by, uh, by how the rise of aviation is caught up in sort of the social milieu of the time. And so the Wright brothers were very much a product of their own time and their age. The excitement of flight in the aftermath of the Wrights successfully demonstrating an airplane is very much a, uh, a ragtime sort of uh, experience in the first decade of the 20th century. The air shows beginning in the latter part of the 19 aughts uh, were these extravaganzas with people going from city to city and demonstrating the capabilities that they had, see how high they could get, how fast they could fly, could they do acrobatics, all of these sorts of activities are a part of the sort of social makeup of this and it's about air-mindedness and how it arose in the first part of the 20th century. We can see this in the way in which people become celebrities. And we're all familiar with Amelia Earhart and Charles Lindbergh, who in the 1920s and 30s were very important. But before that, there was people like Katherine Stinson, who was a tiny woman. She weighed less than 100 pounds, who began to fly in 1909, 1910. She travels around the world, she goes to Japan, and she becomes a great celebrity there. All of this is a part of this, this early milieu and this excitement and this romance with aviation. Flying higher, flying farther, and flying faster has been a mantra from the very beginning of, of the Wright brothers right up to the present. Can we build an airplane that can, that can go above the clouds? can go into the stratosphere perhaps? Can we build an airplane that can fly halfway around the world so that we can essentially reach any destination without having to stop, land, and refuel? Can we build a vehicle that can fly so fast we can set records that we can go coast to coast in the United States in under an hour? All of these are great challenges and they have motivated lots of people to design airplanes that are able to do some of these activities. And, and it's exciting to watch. So when Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic in 1927, that was a big deal. He didn't fly very high. In some cases he was 30 feet off the, off the deck. But he flew a long way and he flew by himself <laughs> and that was pretty significant in 1927 when Chuck Yeager flew the X-1 faster than the speed of sound in 1947 that was a big deal and it signaled a new age of supersonic flight especially for combat getting, getting to the scene fast if you're in a fighter jet is a really important activity the ability to fly high get you above the atmosphere or much of the atmosphere above the clouds a lot of the turbulence that you see if you're bumping along at 10,000 feet in the middle of the clouds it's not a very pleasant experience and if you're above that it's much smoother ride so we all like that all of that is a part of 
what we've tried to accomplish in flight in the 20th century, and we've been remarkably successful. The interesting thing about it is, once we get so fast and so high, we somehow think we're invincible, and that's not really the case. The, the U-2 spy plane, which could fly very, very high and very, very fast, was still a, uh, a vehicle that could be shot down by the Soviet Union in 1960. The SR-71, which could fly even higher and faster, uh, was never shot down, but nonetheless uh, could still be attacked if were a desire to do so. All of this uh, suggests, however, that one element, and we sort of see things come full circle in the latter part of the 20th century with stealth technology. Can you elude radar? Can you be more or less invisible to radar? Well, the interesting challenge about that is it's no longer about high, flying high and fast. It's about going low and slow. And if you go low and slow, you're less susceptible to creating a radar image. And that has been one of the dynamic aspects of modern flight. All of those are fascinating. There's one other piece of this that I think is important. Higher, farther, faster is useful at some level. But in the last two to three decades of the 20th century, there's really been an effort about smarter. And it's mostly about the digital electronic era, as we have built all kinds of capabilities that didn't exist previously. And we've become more efficient with our, with our vehicles. We've become more uh, expansive with what they can do. And fundamentally, it's about this new technology that we have employed in flight. One of the things that's happening in the commercial industry is that we are building aircraft that are more efficient than ever before. And uh, we see this throughout the history of flight. There's no question about that. Anybody who got aboard a Ford Trimotor in the 1920s, sometimes known as Old Shaky, uh, was, could, could fly. It was, an, it was an airline carrier, but it wasn't very pleasant. And the DC-3 was a, really a major step forward in terms of luxury. When you could pressurize cabins and go higher and faster after that, that was a major accomplishment. When you could put a lot more people aboard with wide-body aircraft, especially the 747 in the latter part of the 1960s and into the 1970s, it's a really uh, important set of changes. We've seen this right up to the present. The wide-body aircraft are some of the most luxurious and pleasant to fly in that have ever been built. And modern versions of these are elegant in ways that we've never thought of before, where I can sit there with my laptop or my television screen and watch movies as I cross to Europe or go to Japan or wherever it happens to be. And it's, it's pretty much a, a, a fun experience in terms of flying in those vehicles. So we're seeing this over and over and over again. The latest edition of, of these massive airliners is the uh, Airbus 380, which is a double-decker airplane that can handle 200-plus passengers. All of those are major changes, and we've seen that because of the advance of technology. All right, so Howard Hughes built this airplane during World War II. It was, at the time, the largest cargo or passenger airplane in existence. It was built of wood because metal was in short supply. It was World War II. It's called the Spruce Goose. It was a big airplane. It was a seaplane. You landed it on water and you took off on water. And it flew once. It was not a successful aircraft in any shape or size or in any way in which you would like to uh, characterize it. But it did fly once and it's now a museum display and it's a spectacular museum display, but that's mostly what it's best suited for. Project Apollo was one of that great um, adventures that took place in my youth. I was a kid in high school at the time. And uh, it's sort of sad in a lot of ways, but also wonderful in a lot of ways that in the nearly 50 years since the first landing took place, uh, less than half of the world's population uh, was alive at that time. We now, we now have many people, many, many millions of billions of people 
who were not alive when the landings took place. And in, in the true sense of the term, it's history to them. I experienced it, uh, at, admittedly as a kid, but nonetheless, uh, I experienced it. And it was an adventure. Uh, it was exciting. It was fun. That, of course, raises the interesting question of why did we do it? Why don't we continue to do it today? And the answer to that is it's a product of a time and a circumstance of the 1960s in which the Cold War was very real. The Soviet Union was a, an intense threat. There was a sense that we were going to be annihilated by nuclear weapons pretty much at any point this could happen. We, when I was in grammar school, we would have duck and cover exercises where we crawled under our desks like that would protect us from a nuclear blast. I thought it was stupid when I was 10, and, and I was right. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, this was a very real thing. And the, the moon race, the, the uh, attempt to go to the moon was a demonstration of the technological capability of the United States. We were showing the rest of the world, not so much the Soviet Union, but the rest of the world, that we were second to none when it came to our technical capability. And we all knew that the Cold War was going to be won on the backs of that technical capability. It was about impressing everybody else that we were in the running and, and, and that they should throw their lot in with us and become our allies. It succeeded magnificently for that purpose. But the reality was sending a few astronauts to the moon, bringing back moon rocks, engaging in some lunar science and there's nothing wrong with science by any means, but it did not have the resonance with the public that would have sustained that effort beyond the initial stage of the Apollo program. You know, there's some interesting things that are going to happen in spaceflight, and it's going to happen in the near term. The first thing that I think we're seeing is that low Earth orbit is sort of entering the normal realm of human activity. And this is something that we've seen in terrestrial exploration as well. First you've got usually government-backed uh, explorers who go out and they map this territory that people hadn't seen before, Lewis and Clark, whomsoever you wish to talk about is in this category. But they are followed by individuals who are going to move forward with, uh, with economic activities. Maybe it's fur trading. Maybe it's farming or ranching or something like that. And we're starting to see that in low Earth orbit as well. The other thing about that terrestrial exploration is that one of the things that happens early on is there is a government presence that is created there. The fort in the wilderness, the U.S. cavalry, all of the kinds of things that we think about in our, in our American history along these lines, we're starting to see in space as well. So the International Space Station in Earth orbit is our fort in the wilderness. It is a, an anchor tenant in Earth orbit from which we can operate all kinds of other activities. And we're seeing a, a variety of those. So we've got companies that are engaged in scientific pursuits that are economically motivated. We are seeing space tourists starting to develop, both in the suborbital realm and potentially in the orbital realm down the road. We are seeing free flyers being developed by companies that will be places that people can go to, that scientists can operate from, again with that space station as the anchor tenant. This is a very exciting activity. And I, I like to call attention to, to the movie, and many people have seen it, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And we're sort of seeing what happened there happen in real life. In that particular movie, they had found something on the moon. And on the moon is a, is a colony of researchers who are supported by the government. In orbit, there is a space station, which is more or less a commercial activity. When the central character goes to that space station, he calls back home on an AT&T phone. Some of us remember AT&T is a big company. He walks past a Holiday Inn and a Hilton and so those hotels are located there. He also goes to a Howard Johnson's. That's another, that's another restaurant that most of us don't remember too much about but it used to be a big deal. 
So there's commercial activities there, and we're starting to see that in our Earth orbit today. And I really do think we're following the path that we have followed throughout terrestrial exploration as we move outward. And then there are opportunities to do things with the moon. One of the key aspects of this is can we create a research station there? And totally, it's within our power to do so. We have been to the moon previously, notwithstanding those who would deny it. They are wrong. But the, uh, and, and, and once we do that, it'll probably be initially something that looks a lot like Antarctica. It'll be a government-supported research station with scientists and people who are supporting scientific activities. It'll be funded as a, uh, as a national activity or maybe even an international activity as we engage in understanding more about that. It's only three days away. There's, in, in terms of cosmic distances, it's like next door. So we can get there and back pretty readily. And we can cycle people in and out on a regular basis. I think that that is something we're going to see not in the next century, but within the next half century. Moving from there to families that would go and, and live and have children is another issue. But I think we're going to see that in the 21st century as well. There's a lot of challenges associated with it, but it can be done. We have demonstrated over and over and over again that we have the capability and the innovative minds to meet the challenges that we have before us. And I think we'll see that on the moon too. And of course, then there's obviously Mars. And who doesn't want to go to Mars? I certainly do. When I was a kid growing up, I thought we'd be on Mars before the end of the 20th century. And, and it, it, is a, it is a stunning place. It is, a, it is a, a, a planet that has a lot of the ingredients that we think of. Obviously, it's dry and barren, and the atmosphere is thin. But nonetheless, we could engage in activities on that surface. And indeed, we put robots there several times now, and they've been very successful. Can we create some sort of a, of a base camp there? Can we do some scientific exploration? Can we also then create something that's more permanent down the road? All of those, I think, are possibilities. I think we may well see that in the 21st century. You know, we, we love to talk about uh, the power of, of human curiosity and, uh, and how it propels us to explore things. And, and it does. There's no question about that. There is something in the human ethos that pushes us to climb the mountain, to cross the ocean, to do the things that we think of, and to, to go into space and to explore the moon and, and explore Mars. There's, that's very real. But it, it doesn't sustain it for long periods of time. It provides the impetus. It provides the spark. But ultimately, we're going to seek uh, a, a human endeavor moving forward that has an economic purpose, that uh, has a, a purpose of, of greater good. And those are what's going to sustain it long term. But I think it's going to be sustained. Let me tell you one other story. In 1803, Lewis and Clark went up the Missouri River and explored the American West for the first time for the, the new United States of America. And they were sent by Thomas Jefferson, and the information that they brought back was useful in terms of opening up that territory. The interesting piece of this, in my mind, is something that Stephen Ambrose, the historian, commented on. He said in 1803, when the, when the expedition departed St. Louis and headed up the Missouri River, nothing moved faster than a horse. Nothing had ever moved faster than a horse. And horses really weren't all that fast. And as far as the members of the expedition knew, nothing ever would move faster than a horse. Think about that in the context of what happened thereafter. Within just a very few years, the first steam engine is put onto a boat. You now have a steamboat. Uh, within 25 years of the Lewis and Clark expedition, railroads are starting to be built. A hundred years after the Lewis and Clark expedition, the Wright brothers have built the first practical airplane. And here we are, 
more than 100 years beyond the airplane's first flight, and we are engaging in these fast and enormously exciting activities that were never envisioned 200 and some years ago. It's a, an amazing transformation, and flight has made it possible. Flight in the air and flight in space. We move people and materials around the world in less than a day, routinely. I could board an airplane today and be halfway around the world within just a very few hours. And we do it much more quickly on a spacecraft. Every 90 minutes we can travel around the globe. It is a remarkable set of changes that have just happened in the 20th century. Imagine what the 21st century holds.